For those of you who don't know our speaker this evening, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Emilius of Gullius uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Professor of Gullius is the inaugural holder of the International Banking Law and Finance Chair at Edinburgh. He's an acknowledged expert on financial market regulation, banking law and finance, and global economic governance. He's also the author of a large number of scholarly articles and of two monographs, Governance of Global Financial Markets, The Law, The Economics, The Politics, published the CUP in 2012, and also The Mechanics and Regulation of Market Abuse, A Legal and Economic Analysis, published with OUP in 2005. He also co-authors with Sir Ross Cranston the next edition of Principles of Banking Law. Emilios, as well as being an esteemed academic, is also a qualified practicing lawyer uh, with many years' experience in the field of global markets. He's practiced extensively, sorry, extensively in the broader field of international financial law and structured finance. He's worked as an associate at the Derivatives and Financial Institutions Group of Clifford Chance, as a managing associate at the Financial Markets Group of Linklaters, and also as an equity partner at a large European law firm. And Emilios is here to speak to us this evening on the topic, the future of fractional reserve banking in light of recent reforms. Is Jimmy Stewart dead? And also Professor Ferrin has very kindly agreed to act as an expert discussing in relation to Emilios' paper. And I think in view of our small number, I think we can, we, we, we can proceed with a degree of informality <laughs> uh, if that will enhance the quality of our exchange today. But, uh, Eilis will follow Emilios, but I think we'll begin with Emilios. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Uh, many thanks to Professor Fern for accepting to act as uh, a discussant. Um, uh, this is uh, an effort to bring together work that has uh, started um, in 2010 with a polemic of um, big banks. Um, and um, has not stopped yet, but the latest output is an article with uh, Professor Goodhead on the merits and demerits of the bail-in process and the chapter on um, optimal uh, bank organization. Essentially, it's been an evolutionary process for me from being a, from being a strong uh, polemicist against big banks to being an agnostic. Um, uh, today, the specific presentation will um, try to discuss the nature of fractional reserve banking and what are the problems with fractional reserve banking and especially the dangers of excessive leverage, evaluate uh, the merits of um, uh, regulatory reforms that specifically target fractional reserve banking rather than universal banking or mega banks, the narrow banking alternative leverage ratios and bail-ins, uh, provide a, a realistic assessment of the future and utility of fractional reserve banking. And um, the presentation is within a post-reform context which means it takes as granted the fact that um, the big universal banks are either uh, separated from the, their investment banking arms or they, they are inf ring fenced against risks from their investment banking arms or at some point in the future the resolution authority will ask them to take an arm's length approach to their investment banking arms. So this is not about structural reform. Even though um, the big large banks were at the heart of the uh, global financial crisis and um, not just because of the exotic, um, highly complex, opaque, innovative products that they took on balance sheet or off balance sheet, but also because um, they made some pretty dumb lending decisions. Um, in many cases, um, uh, banks went down because the pretty straightforward lending decisions were wrong especially in the European context where the European bank, uh, the Spanish banks or the Irish banks did nothing exotic, did nothing more than lending big property developers who eventually went bust when the bubble burst. So are these guys um, going to uh, survive the crisis? Uh, before I answer this uh, question, I want to, to go through the fundamentals of fractional reserve banking 
fractional reserve is when banks uh, use the equity that they have and the deposits, uh, the debt that is entrusted to them in order to make out loans and they keep only a fraction of that money as a reserve. That can create, um, that can create uh, depositors' ranks, but the last time I checked we had deposit insurance and lender of last resort uh, facilities for that, so what's the big deal? The other big deal is that the banks, uh, when they make losses and equity is inadequate, this kind of bank can be the non-full reserve bank, can be found that uh, inadequately capitalized and either will be bailed out or bailed in under the new regime or will go under. Now, why, um, why there is so much fuss with uh, debt in uh, banking? Um, there is so much fuss because debt in banking creates serious agency problems. Uh, the more leverage the bank has, the more, uh, the more incentives the shareholders have to push management to maximize return on equity, to uh, maximize profit uh, at the expense of the bank's um, uh, sustainability. At the exp that means at the expense of the bank uh, creditors. And it's uh, unless the uh, creditors become super monitors, even under a bail-in regime, it's difficult to see how that, uh, that's going to change. Obviously, uh, because what uh, fractional reserve banks do is take uh, money from the one side short term and lend money on the other side uh, long term, often they face uh, uh, maturity transformation problems and um, it's very hard to liquidate long term assets so they might face a run or as I said uh, already their um, capital might be insufficient uh, to cover the total of their losses which means a bailout or a bail-in these days. Now leverage is not a bad thing. Um, why? Um, and fractional reserve banks are not a bad thing <laughs> as well. Why? Because they create liquidity, they create liquid um, uh, debt claims. They, uh, they provide their main job is provision of liquidity on demand. And that's a great thing. It's not a bad thing at all, as a matter of fact. That's why we have fractional reserve banks since the first, um, uh, in this country, since uh, the first two banks, which were the Bank of England and the uh, uh, Bank of Scotland, which, uh, which of course was almost shut down after the Jacobite um, uh, troubles because was <laughs> was suspected for Jacobite loyalty, uh, loyalties and as a result the Royal Bank of Scotland came to life. So factional reserve banking is, uh, is a business model that is uh, uh, that has been with us for quite a long time and this country especially is very familiar with it. However, there are problems with leverage when, um, uh, that is when um, owners, shareholders, equity is insufficient because um, the more money you lend, the more bad decisions you make and obviously you will pay the price for those bad decisions um, if you are inadequately capitalized when the economic cycle uh, turns the other way. What makes banks um, accumulating excessive leverage? Well, the more money you have, the more money you lend, the more profit you make. Um, bank profit in principle comes from the fact that they arbitrage between the interest rates they are charged to borrow money from depositors or other wholesale uh, uh, lenders to them and the money they charge were in order to lend out money long term preferably. Then um, managers the, uh, like that because, or sort of like that, uh, because obviously the more money the bank makes, the higher is going to be the remuneration, especially the floating remuneration bonuses. And um, if you have the ability to lower your capital uh, reserves, and capital is a cost to the bank. Uh, because regulation allows you, of course you will do that and you will substitute, substitute uh, unsafe assets to securitization or other forms of asset substitution with safe assets to keep as little uh, capital as possible and lend out as much money as possible in order to, uh, maximize, uh, to maximize profit. Now, 
There are a number of remedies that have been suggested apart from structural reform because, as I said, I'm not going to deal really with structural reform until the very end of uh, the paper. I will return to structural reform at the very end of the paper because perhaps there is no other solution than um, smarter than uh, what we today have structural reform. But the other alternatives apart from separating investment for banking from commercial banking are um, to have a full reserve banking system, what is called the a narrow banking system, uh, whatever the bank borrows from one side uh, lends to the other side. Um, the bank keeps, uh, uh, obviously, if they do that, they have to do that into liquid assets because that's what full reserve uh, means, that you can draw down on your reserve to uh, repay your liabilities immediately. Or we can find better capital ratios and uh, insert more equity into the system by uh, keeping the risk-weighted uh, 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 capital ratios. Uh, I have to, uh, I have to uh, tell you uh, at this point that risk weighted as, uh, ratios were not uh, with us um, uh, before the 70s. They are something that uh, came about uh, in uh, the UK. They were first used by the Bank of England in the late 70s and then um, gradually adopted by Basel. Uh, leverage ratios, on the other hand, is that um, mean that you keep a uh, own funds compared to uh, compared to your assets at without weighting the riskiness of your assets at a certain ratio. And obviously, the higher the ratio, the more equity you need to keep, uh, to have in um, in the bank. Structural form, um, the main model I've already explained is separating through various structures uh, investment banking from uh, commercial banking or ring fencing as is the Vickers uh, suggestion that has been implemented and the final remedy is to have effective resolution eliminate um, eliminate moral hazard and eliminate fiscal backstops mainly through bailing of bank creditors now the first question that we need to ask at this point because after all this is a presentation about the future of fractional reserve uh, banking is can we replace them? Can we get rid of them altogether? Can we imagine a world with no fractional reserve banks? After all, they are susceptible to risk all the time. They are like um, a nuclear reactor which has its uses but it's very volatile and you know uh, it doesn't go off all the time but when it goes off, boom, Fukushima. So, uh, can we make um, do without them? These graphs show you the level of um, loans outstanding in each of the, um, in each of the countries uh, selected, the United States, Japan and Europe. As you can see, especially Europe is overbanked because in the United States um, the uh, level of bank lending uh, to GDP is much lower, it's around 50%, whereas in um, in Europe is slightly over 100% and as you can see uh, in Japan it fluctuates wildly because of um, because the fortunes of the Japanese economy are fluctuating wildly the past few years but Japan is also uh, quite dependent on bank lending and as a matter of fact that's the case throughout Asia if we had replaced uh, if we had replaced in this graph uh, uh, Southeast Asia in general, instead of Japan, we would see that uh, uh, growth capital uh, in most of Southeast Asia is coming from bank lending. And uh, uh, Asian banks, uh, the big banks, are having assets that equal 100% of GDP or over in, uh, in, most, uh, uh, big, in most of the large Asian economies. And so, Emilius, the reason the US is so low compared to Europe is capital the market lines. development. Yeah, yeah, so capital it, market development. Equity reliance rather than capital debt. or debt. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Market, through uh, the capital yeah. markets. Yeah. So um, that's my next slide. Obviously, uh, share of bank versus capital markets lending in uh, in um, especially in the eurozone because these are the figures I could find. As you can see, the figures are extremely current. I pulled them from the ECB site that shows you the entire balance sheet 
of the uh, Eurozone uh, on the 25th of April. So <coughs> loans outstanding to non-sovereigns, 12.6 uh, trillion. Of, uh, if you compare that to global bonds outstanding to non-financials, um, 1.4 trillion in 2012, 1.8 trillion in 2007. That means that uh, bank lending just in the Eurozone to non-sovereigns dwarfs global uh, issues of uh, uh, debt, uh, corporate debt outstanding. Uh, and there is a massive, massive funding gap in, uh, in Europe. Uh, according to the European Investment Bank, uh, Europe needs to invest almost half a trillion a year in economic infrastructure and the bond markets are not really playing that role. Of course, there is uh, a plan for uh, a capital markets union, but that's far off into the future and also you need to take into account cultural preferences and uh, path dependence. There is a reason why Europe is so overbanked and uh, why uh, reliance on capital markets uh, uh, debt or equity is so low and I think this, um, this slide uh, helps even uh, more to uh, make a better job to show you Europe's uh, reliance on bank lending for uh, corporate capital. Okay, so uh, the reliance on fractional reserve banks for corporate lending is massive. No two ways about it. Uh, why uh, Mark's question was uh, very opposite because capital markets in Europe are not especially risk capital markets, venture capital markets, uh, private equity markets are not as developed as in the United States. It's not just an issue of the size of the stock market, it's even more an issue of what is the size of the risk capital market and the size of the risk capital market in the United States dwarves the junk bonds market, for instance, which is risk capital market funding, uh, risk capital market finance, um, uh, dwarfs that in Europe and the Eurozone. The UK is doing slightly better than the rest of Europe. Well, substantially better than the rest of Europe, but still uh, the UK is also very reliant, for, uh, over -reliant on uh, fractional reserve banks for corporate borrowing. So, um, let's make fractional reserve banks safer then. And um, one of the ways to make them safer is strict lever addresses. Uh, before we discuss where we should put um, the lever address, uh, we should consider if they are a good thing. Uh, there, is a, there is an article by D'Angelo and Stooge, both respected economists, in 2013 who said that banks should carry a high leverage and leverage ratios are not a good thing because the main role of the bank is to create uh, stable debt claims and um, uh, the so-called liquidity glow to produce liquid debt, uh, liquid debt claims and um, if banks use their own money, which is equity, they will not be able to do the same function. Obviously, there are lots of objections to the D'Angelo and Stuart uh, thesis, uh, but in principle, that's the job of fractional reserve banking, to create liquid uh, uh, debt claims, liquidity on demand. The, question, the next question is whether you need debt to do that, or you can also use your equity to uh, do that, and my view is more on the side of the uh, higher equity uh, reserves. But um, leverage ratios per se, uh, they, apart from being macroprudential micro micro measure, can also be a strong macroprudential measure because they reduce the level of overall lending, of all, overall borrowing in uh, the economy, in the uh, financial system as well as the uh, real economy. And of course, because they are unweighted, they uh, reduce reliance on any risk models. So, um, or credit ratings, which are all uh, very pro-cyclical. So uh, they are indeed a stabilizing mechanism uh, for both the financial system and the real economy. 
As a matter of fact, UK banks uh, adjusted their capital to the risks they were taking in the uh, 19th century. Of course, uh, there is a question here whether what um, UK banks were doing in the 19th century is really relevant uh, because we don't have uh, really the share of capital markets funding in the 19th century. And as a matter of fact, uh, the 19th century is an appalling time for British banks. Uh, they, were, um, uh, they were falling down like dead pigeons. And we had some massive, uh, massive uh, runs. However, indeed, uh, uh, Cappy and Wood have produced uh, a very interesting study that shows that uh, if bankers were willing to uh, take uh, higher risks, they were adjusting their capital reserves to those higher risks. And there is another C minor uh, study by Miles et al., uh, David Miles is in the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, which showed that uh, bank leverage um, really took off in the 20th century, especially in the post war years, but it didn't really have an appreciable, uh, an, uh, it didn't really make an appreciable difference in uh, economic growth rates. Uh, the driver of the economic growth, uh, the drivers of economic growth were different factors rather than high leverage. Now, uh, does that matter? Does the debate between uh, unweighted leverage ratios and weighted leverage ratios matter? According to the uh, Prudential Regulation Authority, um, in the 2013 stress test, uh, certain uh, UK banks, paragons of the UK's financial system, had a much higher um, tier one capital if uh, measured against risk-weighted assets rather than uh, if uh, um, their equity capital was uh, measured against unweighted assets. And that's uh, very important because uh, if your risk weights are lying, you are severely undercapitalized. Now, there are good reasons uh, to argue against leverage ratios. Uh, one is that um, if I can't lend as much as I like, I might choose uh, riskier assets because this will produce higher returns because shareholders, uh, shareholders' pressure for returns will not disappear because of the introduction or imposition of, um, of leverage ratios. And uh, leverage ratios can uh, constrict economic growth unless they are cycle adjusted. And as a matter of fact, the Bank of England's new leverage ratio for the uh, UK's banking system is cycle, uh, is cycle adjusted. It is a modification of the counter cyclical uh, buffer of uh, Basel and in a rather clever way, uh, me thinks. I should say at this point that one of the major uh, mistakes that the macroprudential, uh, the macroprudential debate makes is um, probably emanating from the fact that Minsky did not have enough time to uh, broaden. His theory is that they only think about the financial system. Obviously, there is a wider world out there that, uh, that generates supply and demand for uh, uh, the financial system uh, generates supply for financial claims, but there is a wider world out there that needs uh, that funding. So unless you unless you uh, link up the um, leverage ratios and all the other macroprudential uh, indicators and measures with the way the macroeconomy performs, obviously uh, macroprudential um, uh, regulation will have the same fate as other um, regulatory. Um, approaches in the past which uh, eventually hit a blind alley. It's very important that you link up uh, what you do as a financial regulator with the way the uh, economy, economy uh, performs uh, rather than just focusing on how the financial system uh, behaves. Now, um, if we are uh, going back from um, leverage uh, ratios on unweighted assets, if we stick with the Basel approach to risk weighted um, uh, capital, how much capital? Um, help with, uh, that means equity capital, not uh, Basel uh, additional tier one or tier two capital, shareholders equity. 
uh, Basel is uh, asking for four and a half, but that's Basel three. But obviously there is a, a conservation buffer of up to two and a half. Uh, there is a counter cyclical buffer of another up to two and a half, and there is a, a, a surcharge on uh, the globally systemically important, highly interconnected bonds. That is not, as a matter of fact, out of line with uh, total capital requirements, equity requirements, uh, um, than the historical average. Uh, there are studies that have shown that historical average is um, above 15% of equity, but uh, under 20%. This is, however, lower than the 25% tier one that has been suggested by Helwigen, that Marty and Miles at all as a way to make uh, fractional reserve banking uh, more stable. Now, um, if you go for 25% equity, obviously you need to uh, you need to find somebody to buy bank shares, to buy bank equity. And in order to find somebody to do that, you need to look at the uh, profitability of the bank. Shareholders are still interested in dividends and capital appreciation, um, market price appreciation. The problem is that uh, the profitability, especially of European banks, is very low. The uh, profitability of the US banks is much higher. And um, e Higher net equity uh, capital reserves might not really have an appreciable impact on the cost of funding, on the cost of bank lending. Miles et al. think that will not exceed um, half percent, probably will be less. Basel agrees. But where are you going to find the money if the banks make no profit? Who is going to, who is going to invest in European banks if they are not a profitable investment? Uh, well, there is another way to bring uh, capital ratios up by shedding assets. But that means that you're shedding out to the totally unregulated shadow banks. And uh, obviously you're not lending in an economy that, as we said, uh, is starved for new finance. Another alternative is full reserve banking. Whatever I receive from depositors, I invest in uh, safe assets. Um, and the first model is joint case asset, a uh, joint case uh, model. Uh, banks take their deposits and are investing them in uh, uh, sovereign bonds. Uh, they do limited uh, uh, lending, so uh, perfect uh, way to balance your in terms of maturity, so riskiness, your liabilities with your um, asset side, and to have. Um, the perfect model of full reserve uh, banking. But of course, all perilous forms of lending would be outside the perimeter of uh, prudential regulations, so all wholesale banking will go to the shadow banks, and sovereign bonds, and that come from Greece, are not really a safe investment <laughs> for anybody, as a matter of fact. <laughs> then there is um, the much discussed um, uh, model of narrow banking by Professor Kotlikov to whom obviously the title uh, slide refers, because he had a famous book, uh, that Jimmy Stewart is Dead, obviously that's a reference to uh, a great movie, What a uh, Wonderful Life. It's a mid-30s movie which we're watching every year as uh, young kids uh, on Christmas Eve, that shows a thrift, a Midwestern thrift in the United States, going bankrupt because it was not a full reserve bank, but it was a fractional reserve bank, and the reserves were not enough to repay depositors. Uh, having said that, I thought that we had resolved that with uh, sufficient deposit insurance and, uh, and the lender of last resort facility. Um, uh, I thought that um, uh, budget with um, his um, uh, book on Lobart Street uh, in uh, the late 19th century and the Dubvik and Diamond uh, article, which obviously opened the process for deposit insurance uh, across the board, had resolved that, but uh, uh, apparently not because of Northern Rock. Northern Rock was not exactly run on the bank's deposits. Northern Rock was... Uh, it was obviously uh, an issue of the Bank of England uh, 
uh, taking the moral hazard risk uh, too seriously and not uh, providing uh, Northern Rock with additional uh, liquidity in a timely manner. And also the fact that Northern Rock was not really uh, properly supervised uh, when it came to systems of controls as well as its capital base and everything else. And the uh, website, the website went down and didn't go back. So people who uh, were holding electronic deposits thought that they lost all their money and they land up uh, the streets. So um, it's not, uh, in, uh, the Northern Rock incident is not necessarily a failure of the factional reserve system. It's more a failure to supervise the bank properly and uh, uh, oblige the bank to upgrade its uh, technical systems um, uh, because obviously when your bank is in trouble and all you see is a blank screen, you will panic. And that's what happened uh, with Northern Rock. Um, according to Kotlikov, however, we need to uh, make all banks, all financial institutions, full reserve institutions, more or less like mutual funds, and you get what is the net asset value uh, divided by your um, share in the units of the mutual fund. That means, uh, however, that the mutual fund uh, cannot really invest in long-term assets because I cannot see how the liquidity issue will be resolved. You will still need a, a central bank if you face a liquidity shock on the liability side. It's not discussed really in the uh, Kotlikov uh, uh, paper. Uh, obviously, the other thing that you need to take into account here is that if it's all financial institutions, that means no regulatory arbitrage and you need a global treaty. Or you need capital controls. Um, otherwise, somebody else will come, uh, will come and start competing with you on interest rates, uh, taking over uh, your customers. A full, reserve, uh, a full reserve banking probably will not need the fiscal uh, backstop because there is no leverage. I'm not sure that will not need lender of last resort um, uh, uh, provision, which was the whole point. And uh, as I said, requires perfectly rational bank managers perfect coordination between the asset and the liabilities uh, side, otherwise you will face a liquidity run. Uh, perfect rationality across the system, no asset bubbles, and of course, either a global treaty or uh, uh, capital controls, because if anybody else comes and offers higher interest rates, your, uh, your customers will disappear immediately. <coughs> Assuming that um, the uh, money of your depositors, of your unit holders, have gone to liquid assets, which normally do not offer high, high interest rates. They are low risk, low return assets. Uh, and of course, since liability will be unlimited, it's interesting to see who is going to be a shareholder in such an institution. Now, on the other hand, more modern thinking, and given what happened with the uh, uh, bailouts, which allegedly cost lots of taxpayer money, uh, we have moved, uh, regulatory thinking has moved uh, away from bailouts and moral hazard and the too big to fail subsidy into bailing in uh, cent set, apart from the bank shareholders, center. Uh, certain bank uh, creditors bailing any liabilities in order to uh, in order to absorb bank losses and not to have to resort to public money and that's a good thing because bailouts create more hazard you uh, uh, you behave uh, irresponsibly recklessly if you know that you're going to be bailed out uh, as a bank manager um, it can be expensive and of course some uh, sovereigns are over indebted and they cannot really bail out their, their uh, banks, their financial institutions. The reason that uh, Ireland's debt uh, uh, multiplied by four was because of bank bailouts. Uh, Ireland was one of the least indebted countries in the world until uh, 
the bank bailouts and of course Spain's debt went up and so on. Now, of course, that's a sorry story for the UK because of what happened with the Royal Bank of Scotland bailout. But other countries have not really lost money. Um, uh, the uh, US Treasury and the, uh, the US Treasury did not lose money through the Troubled Assets Relief Program or direct uh, equity injections to troubled financial institutions through the US Treasury. Uh, the uh, Swedish uh, Treasury made money when they bailed out their, uh, their banks to a bad bank in the early 90s. And of course, if you know that the sovereign is there standing ready to absorb losses, the scope for contagion is uh, substantially narrowed down. On the other hand, uh, as I explained, a bail-in regime can, um, it can eliminate uh, moral hazard and having recourse to public money incentivizes creditors to become better, uh, better uh, corporate monitors. The a too big to fail subsidy was anti-competitive in any case because a very small number of big banks enjoyed that. It's easier to plan for resolution and supposedly it leads to faster recapitalization. Now, the first question that arises within a bail-in regime is who should carry the burden? The taxpayers have not chosen to undertake the risk of, um, of um, uh, a, an investment in a financial institution, a bank, and uh, allegedly it's, uh, it's uh, unfair to oblige the taxpayers who cannot flee to um, cover the losses and obviously they play no monitoring role whatsoever, even though one would suggest that that's why you have financial regulators acting as agents and um, undertaking the monitoring role on behalf of the taxpayers as much as society at large. But um, in any case, creditors, uh, uh, creditors are better monitors, uh, it is uh, assumed. However, why, um, who are going to be these creditors to be bailed in? Obviously, pension funds, as it happened in Cyprus, the University of Cyprus, charities, uh, perhaps in the end we'll end up with uh, uh, money going from uh, one pocket and ending up in the other and vice, uh, vice versa. And it's of course not clear whether the University of Cyprus was a better monitor than uh, the Central Bank of Cyprus, which of course was not a very effective bank supervisor. Now, uh, unlike, unlike bailouts, uh, where you have the certainty that the state um, stands there to absorb uh, bank losses, and of course the tax cannot easily flee, unfortunately, uh, in the case of bail-in, you have lots of classes of creditors, uh, some of whom uh, can be highly mobile, especially depositors. Uh, of course, the modern uh, bail-in regimes, especially the European regime, uh, make it implicit that probably even uninsured depositors will not be touched in the, if, if uh, resolution authorities are faced with uh, the prospect of a generalized crisis or uh, they are faced with the prospect of uh, uh, creating contagion and a systemic, uh, a, a system-wide shock in the event that they bail in big, um, big uh, depositors. That means that the, um, that means that the uh, burden will fall more or less on uh, bondholders. But this can flee as well. Uh, equity holders can sell their equity short, and bondholders uh, can sell their uh, their assets and move um, move to other markets altogether. In some cases. So, um, in summary, in spite its important advantages and merits, the bailing process also has some potentially important disadvantages. It might prove to be more contagious and procyclical. Obviously, it will happen when, um, when the economy is not doing very well. 
uh, whether it will lead to speedier recapitalization of the bank or not is to be seen because obviously it will entail much more litigation. Uh, the, uh, it's unclear whether the subsequent liquidity injections uh, will come from. If in the conversion you get lots of vulture funds becoming the shareholders, you end up in a substantially worse uh, situation when it comes to governance. And the best example is not the Russian uh, plutocrats in, uh, in uh, Cyprus. The best example is the Coop Bank in uh, the United Kingdom, which has uh, a substantial uh, a substantial part of its uh, shareholding body is uh, vulture funds and hedge pressing, funds. Pressing for governance reform. That's a case for governance reform to restrict what they're voting. No, but I mean a lot of the pressure on the cooperative bank has come from those sort of aggressive shareholders seeking to have their governance improvements. So I don't think the I don't think the cooperative governance has got worse. No. By reason of having that's true. those investors. Has it? That's true, but you really end up with very aggressive investors. Yeah. But that might be a good thing. I mean the, and and if you and surely I don't see how the cooperative bank can be held out as an example of the um, disadvantages well, or the drawbacks. Exposed, exposed, it will be very difficult to take any long-term decision in the face of having lots of vultures and hedge funds asking for returns. Maybe, but as an example of demonstrating already the problem, I don't think it's... You mean a... given the cooperative bank's governance was in such a state yes, exactly. before the vultures came exactly. in? Yeah. <laughs> I fully agree that yeah. the cooperative bank is not really a model of good governance. On the contrary, the big question is that exposed when you need to take major restructuring and um, reinvestment decisions, whether it's best to, fa to be faced with lots of pension funds as uh, mm -hmm. you were before, uh, before restructuring or with lots of hedge funds that will ask you yeah. for returns. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, uh, the exposed outcomes can be worse for the rest of the industry as well because it's not just that the cost of funding uh, for the building bank will uh, uh, go up, but for everybody else uh, in the industry the cost of funding will go up because obviously the market will not think entirely rationally and they will, um, they will think that, aha, the bail-in risk is a real risk and might happen to anybody at any moment. I need to uh, factor that into my into the interest rate I charge for any money that I lend to the financial sector and especially to big banks. Having said that, obviously the, ba the purpose of the bail-in is to make uh, uh, bank funding um, more expensive ex-ante in order to eliminate the too big to fail subsidy. Here I'm talking about making uh, outcomes for the sector uh, worse ex post. Could I just clarify something I didn't understand? It's, it's, it's my misunderstanding, uh, it's a problem, but why is, bail, why is the bail-in process more pro-cyclical than the bail-out process? Well, the bail-out process is not really pro-cyclical because there is no panic. Yeah. Yeah, the banks are bailed out. This is yeah. it. Yeah, you stop the panic. Yeah. There, there is a, a backstop. There is a discontinuity. The state has moved in yeah, of course. and, and yeah. takes over. Yeah, the state also moves in and takes over. And they, I mean, if you're in resolution, which is where you have to be before you do bailing, you're being run by resolution authority, and with a view to, with a view to kind of. Yeah, but this is the this is the bail-in is not uh, as to uh, as to who takes over the resolution uh, process. Uh, of course, management will be replaced. Mm. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, management will be re replaced can be replaced even at the pre-insolvency uh, stage yeah. on the basis of the new right. powers that the resolution authorities and supervisory mm. authorities have. Um, this is about who is going to pick up 
cost who is going to cap the losses. And uh, if you have a big daddy with a big purse, you know that the bag stops there. Mm. Whereas uh, if you do not, obviously the shocks keep being amplified into the entire financial system. Except that you do have a resolution fund. Once you've done bailing, you then can tap the resolution fund. Correct, and then you go to the big daddy, which is uh, if that's not enough. Yeah. Now, the United States is slightly different. You go to uh, the resolution fund, uh, uh, and if that's not enough, then you go to the industry and you charge assessments, which can potentially lead uh, to mutualization of bank debt. Mm -hmm. In any case, it's much clearer as to who is going to pay with the bailout, and that's the point. Yeah. So with bail-in, sorry, just, just for my lack of knowledge, for bail-in, you go to the resolution fund first, then the private bank? No, no, you, no, it's the other way around. It's no, like you do a bail-in yeah. of the creditors first. Right, then you go to the resolution fund. Yes. Laptop. Okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, in conclusion, we all want safe banks. Does that mean the preservation of factional reserve banking? As far as I'm concerned, yes. But if you want to have factional reserve banking on a cross-border basis, you do need, on the basis of the preceding analysis, to have some kind of fiscal burden sharing across the borders. If, if you have such a fiscal backstop across the borders, obviously, as a last resort, not front stop, but as it was before 2008, uh, any kind of fiscal backstop is a social subsidy. That means that as a society, we need to uh, realize that uh, funding that comes from factional reserve banks cannot be replaced by capital markets, at least in Europe, and at least for the foreseeable future. And as a result, we uh, suffer, um, we impose the social subsidy uh, in order to shore up fractional reserve banks and keep performing to the extent that they have been doing that their role in fostering economic growth. If that becomes unacceptable, and I think should be acceptable, but if that becomes unacceptable, then we need to rethink the model of structural reform that we have adopted, because what is at stake here is what happens with wholesale funding. And if we, um, if bail-in is not going to work to create safe cross-border banking, safe uh, international banking, as some people believe, including myself, then something has to be done about wholesale banking. And uh, in that case, a, either wholesale banks will have to become full reserve, but then uh, you will lose the liquidity gains, the liquidity glow that factional reserve banks uh, enjoy because of leverage if they become full reserve and 100% uh, um, uh, capital reserve for every uh, penny they lend out, or they will uh, become highly levered uh, mutual funds with investment banks turning into partnerships. And uh, all money um, coming to them will be in the form of short-term claims from deposit-taking institutions, obviously on the basis of contractual arrangements. It sounds to me terribly complicated and possibly unfeasible, but uh, uh, aside from state ownership, which God forbid, um, I'm not one of those who argue for full nationalization of the, uh, of the financial system, on the contrary, but aside from uh, state ownership, of the banking sector, I cannot see an alternative between uh, fiscal backstops for factional uh, reserve banks, even though cross-border factional reserve banks, even though that's a social subsidy, or rethinking the model of wholesale banking, taking it all together from the uh, current uh, model of um, uh, bank regulation and structural reform, and perhaps turning wholesale banks into leveraged uh, mutual funds that will uh, enjoy liquidity 
liquidity through borrowing from deposit taking institutions and will be supervised separately than the rest of the banking system, which may be both inefficient and unfeasible. So I think the only solution for the foreseeable future is fiscal backstops. You said that both holders can, can, can run and uh, flee from the day in. But uh, how can this happen? I mean, uh, even if they sell as their bots in the secondary markets, uh, information would, be, would have been disseminated into the secondary markets and the price will reflect this. I mean, how exactly how can, how can they flee? I don't see how, how they can flee. Well, um, the claim will not disappear, but you will yeah, face a different kind. Used. You will face a different kind of bond holder. In case of pension funds, you are going to have lots of uh, vulture funds in their uh, in their place waiting to be bailed in, and obviously across the board, this will reverberate, and uh, banks will find fewer fewer institutions willing to buy their bonds, which means their cost of funding will go up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That I didn't say, I said the bondholders will flee. I didn't say that the claims will be cancelled. Yeah, they will not. The, the claims will be transferred. The, the claims so, will be transferred to different kinds of institutions. The institutions that look for bargains into the global bond markets, and these are specific institutions, mostly in the vulture funds. The Greek bonds didn't stay in the, uh, in the hands of... Um, uh, the Greek bonds uh, were not exactly bailed in, but there was a massive haircut, which is the same as a bail-in. The Greek bonds uh, on the whiff of restructuring and the steep haircut didn't stay in the hands of the big banks that were holding them initially in 2010. These were sold, uh, sold, to, uh, or sold off to a different kind of institution at massive uh, discounts. So it comes back to the same point again. I mean, okay, the, your point seems to be that these um, claims that are bailed in are then, in, you're then going to be left with a kind of shareholder base because they will be... Who will be short termists. Who, who we don't like mm -hmm. and we don't think will be uh, sort of a good, a good influence within the, the, the sort of government. Exposed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas but the same shareholder ex ante may be a good thing, as you pointed yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. but, I have a question. Uh, as China just introduced the deposit insurance system, uh, I have a question. In other countries, how uh, how does the individual saver uh, uh, get any money or remedies uh, when the bank is robbed? In most countries of the developed world, there is a, a deposit insurance system. Yes. Uh, what is worrying is that um, uh, in Asia, especially, the resolutions, uh, the resolution regimes are not really as developed as they are in the West. The West has learned from their mistakes. The, uh, admittedly, the banking systems in Asia are, well, we don't know until the cycle turns. But on the face of it, they are more stable because after the 1997-98 crisis, uh, um, uh, a number of uh, jurisdictions implemented the macroprudential measures uh, indicated to them or dictated to them by the IMF and the other international lenders and as a result at least on the face of it their financial uh, institutions and uh, are better capitalized and their financial systems less leveraged and obviously there is a tradition of equity financing in, uh, in uh, Asia. Whether that's the case uh, in in light of this post-2000 boom or not, only the next crisis <laughs> will say. But uh, uh, indeed, most developed jurisdictions have uh, highly developed and uh, sensitive uh, deposit insurance schemes. Uh, the problem is with bank leverage. Are their banks really as well capitalized as the regulators think they are? Only the next crisis will show. Yeah. A, a few words, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you, Amelia, for such a... Before you begin, Anish, uh, uh, to move should, there. Well, we are, even though there's only six of us in the room, uh, we're going to be watched literally by thousands of people on iTunes, <laughs> and our iTunes hits for 3CL are 
large and we could, Daniel will selectively cut, so this part of the conversation probably won't be in it. But uh, it's up to you, Eilish. Yeah, if you want to be, yeah, if you want to be in iTunes, you can swap places. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm very glad to yeah. leave my place by <laughs> Just a few words, really. Um, well, I think you know, that was, and particularly, I think, for people who are not um, perhaps spending their days looking at these issues, you don't perhaps appreciate just how much there was in that presentation and how much you managed to move across in a very, very wide-ranging um, survey of where we are and where we've got to and what remains. Um, so I would have to uh, really um, congratulate you on that and thank you for that. Um, if I understood what you're saying correctly, you seem to be saying, well, we have to face up to the realities here, look through the rhetoric. So if we look at the um, uh, the National Stability Board, it tells us in its last kind, well, we think that um, you know, the work of agreeing the measures that we need to fix the fault lines is substantially complete, and now we just need to do implementation. So I think you very rightly um, are uh, taking the role of the, 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 the detached academic scholarly and saying, well, actually, we've reached a point where we have a choice that we might not like, we have to face up to. Either we stay with our existing financial system and recognise that it has certain strengths, but it brings with it certain weaknesses and risks to society. Um, and society ultimately has to be the backstop in respect to those risks, or we have to change our financial system, our banking system, very radically in ways that will bring with them their own um, sort of difficulties and risks to society as well. So I think that you're, you know, absolutely right to put that very clear choice on the table. Um, but I just slightly want to press you a bit. Because I think that um, you know, that detached scholarly critical reflection, very good thing that we do, but perhaps sometimes it can become slightly, um, you know, all the academics ever do is to uh, find the problems. We problematize everything. We're much better than that than we are at saying, right, this is what we need to do. This is the thing that won't make it all perfect, but ha might sort of make a difference. Um, and so maybe push you a little bit in, in that direction of saying, you know, are there things we can do that perhaps, you know, accept the problems, not trying to solve the big problems at the, at the, at the margins, but perhaps there is something we can, improve and there's one area and I know you covered so much and it would be totally uh, sort of unfair to say oh but you didn't mention this but nevertheless there is one this that I, I will mention and perhaps it, this is an area because I know you have written about um, the development of an even notion form of governance in respect of this area so the one to me slightly surprising gap in what you covered was with respect to the role of supervisors and supervisory stress tests. So Daniel Tarullo, for example, has described stress tests as the cornerstone of the new approach to uh, regulation supervision. They're dynamic, they're data-driven, they're both micro and macro prudential. Um, so we can see a world of, um, you know, sort of stress tests, done regularly by supervisors, feeding into the supervisory review, feeding into their pillar two assessments, and a dynamic adjustment of capital requirements um, to reflect both institution specific and um, systemic uh, sort of conditions on a sort of rolling basis. So, um, 
so really that's that's I suppose my 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 sense you know I agree with you that you know, we cannot solve problems that are ultimately intractable we have to just do the best in what we've got um, um, but is there more by way of the kind of contribution to to that sort of task that we can uh, you can contribute and in that regard um, did you leave out stress tests because you can't cover everything, or did you leave them out and the supervisory review associated with them because that reflects your assessment that actually they're not so important as, as for example, Torilla suggested? That's my question. Um, thanks very much, Agnes. That's, uh, uh, that's a very critical and important comment. and. Uh, uh, possibly a, a gap in the paper as well, the role of supervisors. I am um, um, uh, not skeptical of the role of supervisors and supervisory stress tests. Uh, what I'm skeptical of is whether, uh, because obviously the regulatory framework has been improved and augmented, so here we talk about extreme risks that might happen. And I don't think that there are stress tests and their models can capture those uh, risks so that they can model everything and even if they do I'm not sure what kind of remedy they suggest that they will use are they going to use risk weighted uh, asset uh, ratios uh, to capture those risks uh, with no uh, no assurance whatsoever that the risk weights are the right uh, risk weights or they will uh, they will uh, vary leverage ratios. If um, if the latter, I have I have written a paper that says that leverage ratios are indeed the best way to bring stability into uh, the system. So um, uh, indeed, I the paper was very wide, so I didn't reach the point of referring to a supervisory action. Probably should. At the same time, uh, uh, apart from varying leverage ratios and increasing ex ante uh, leverage restrictions, I cannot see what else they can do to provide really uh, fail proof remedies against failure, waterproof remedies against uh, failure. And that's a rather blunt instrument and has nothing to do with their very sophisticated and dynamic uh, stress tests. Any other questions? And I was just comment, so anything that Milius has said. I've got a couple of things I want to follow up on, but I'd rather be democratic. <laughs> just by way of clarification, uh, in your final slide, in fact, I think it's the one you've got up, uh, when you present this sort of dilemma of uh, do we pay the social subsidy? for fractional reserve banking, or do we go down the structural reform route and perhaps change banks into very different animals? Well, uh, within the first category of the social subsidy, are you just talking about bailouts, or would bail-ins fall into the social subsidy category too? No, bail-in is uh, uh, privatisation of social risk. So that would be a third option almost? Uh, no, no, they I mean, uh, I'm talking yeah, about fiscal burden sharing arrangements, which yeah. of course are a fiscal uh, subsidy at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. that means that uh, the Treasury picks up part of the bill mm -hmm. of bank failure, and that's a, a social subsidy. Mm -hmm. Bail-ins are elimination of uh, the social subsidy, and obviously I talk about the extreme cases because, as yeah. I've said, the regulatory framework has substantially improved uh, uh, since 2008 and so have supervisors and supervisory ability skills, um, their tool, uh, toolbox and, uh, and so on. But still, extreme risks will happen and will happen because uh, the very idea of fractional reserve banking is uh, a levered provision of uh, liquidity to society. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, uh, it's a case of whether you can entirely privatize the risk or um, the society in the guise of the treasury, obviously, of public funding, 
can pick up some of the cost. Obviously, all risks in the world, all substantial risks are insured, but if the insurer goes bankrupt, we have a reinsurance structure. So uh, basically what the paper says is that it's inevitable if we want to keep the current model of fractional reserve banking, that from time to time states, especially for international banks, act as reinsurance, uh, reinsurers. Obviously that's going to be uh, the case in extreme scenarios and for extreme risks. Otherwise, perhaps we need to face up to uh, the possibility that we need to change. The, uh, we need to change the way we extend credit to society and uh, the way fractional reserve banks are structured has to be radically rethought. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I'm not entirely clear, for instance, what an internet credit provider in China, which is something between a deposit-taking institution an electronic portfolio and the lender uh, is um, a shadow bank, a fractional reserve bank, mm. a, a investment institution, or just a mobile or internet uh, payments provider. Mm. So I think we move, um, a, a, because of financial innovation as well, fractional reserve banking is moving into grayer and grayer and grayer uh, areas. And uh, yeah, perhaps there is room to rethink what uh, fractional reserve banks should be all about and how they should be regulated. However, if they want, we want to keep them as the principal suppliers of liquidity to society as they are today, perhaps they are inevitable social cost. I just wondered whether your point um, is touching on, because at some points you're saying, well, we'll end up with sort of the, the creditors who are bailed in will be these incredibly aggressive vulture funds and the like, and you're concerned about that. But in another place you're saying, well, the creditors who will be bailed in will actually be people who we would be concerned from a societal perspective as having to absorb this cost. Their charities, their, their small, medium-sized pension funds, their individual savers and the like. So in a sense that there is a kind of Social, mm. yeah. and I thought that that's was what I was thinking. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. it's yeah. not the state, but it's yeah. society, and a yeah, it's socialization of yeah. yeah, if you yeah. bail in, yeah. if you bail in pension funds, you end up with the same, uh, you end up in the same, uh, uh, in the same place that you have started with bailouts. Again, you have socialization of of risk. So, uh. Indeed, while bailing has been thought of, and that's a very good point, and thank you for the clarification, Irish, because I didn't uh, understand the uh, question initially. Sorry, sorry, uh, indeed, uh, bailing has been thought of and conceived as a way to privatize the risk. But the whole point of my paper with Goodhart as well is that if you bail in pension funds, basically you have socialized the risk again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And that's the whole point of the, uh, or oh, one of the main points of the paper with uh, Professor Goodhead, mm -hmm. the series of papers. As a matter of fact. Yeah. You're absolutely right that you have not really resolved the problem by pushing it back to society. Because mm. the way I was looking at it was, I suppose... Yeah, I, I didn't understand the question. I, was, I, I wasn't very clear, but I suppose the way, in my head, the way I was looking at it was rather than see bailouts as public and bail-ins as private, I suppose I was thinking more in terms of... Uh, the, the, the broadness of the group of the public who were covered. So a bailout is everybody. Uh, sorry, a bailout is everybody, or at least everybody who pays tax. Mm. A bail-in is kind of the middle class people <laughs> who've got yeah. some sort of stake. Which brings us uh, to these uh, couple of slides, which discuss who should carry the burden. Mm. Yeah. Is it really better that the pensioners instead of or the savers instead of the taxpayers should carry the burden? Mm, yeah, yeah, I thought I had touched on this. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just because just there was one other thing uh, which which kind of... Uh, it was just the, the way you explained it kind of threw up a, a really confusing issue. Not not confusing in your paper, but confusing in the, the concept itself. When, when you were discussing the leverage ratios as a, as a means of controlling risk, it seemed to me there's an inherent circularity at play because, as you explained, 
really well, and I've never heard this explained before, that if you're trying to ensure a high, safe, theoretically safe, high equity to debt ratio, who do you turn to? Well, naturally, you turn to prospective shareholders to pump more equity into the bank. Who would want to earn something on that? And presumably, as you've also explained in your paper, shareholders very often want uh, they want a high return on equity, which surely means a high debt to equity ratio. So the people you're turning to to pump up your equity to debt ratio are the very people that don't that want the opposite, surely. So is is that is that just an inherent circularity? Is of course, a... of course there is. But uh, if you if you just uh, stick with unweighted leverage ratios, hmm. um, uh, the advantage is that. Um, uh, once a uh, bank hit the ratio, the ceiling, they stop lending, and that could be a bad thing, but also in, uh, in a booming economy, that could be a good thing. To give you, uh, to give you an example, um, I don't think that the UK banks need to, uh, need, uh, to lend out more money to the UK's housing market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they do not, probably the housing market will cool off. So when you cannot use the monetary uh, instrument, you cannot raise interest rates, perhaps leverage ratios are a good way, equity is a good way to absorb losses ex exposed. Mm. But leverage ratios are a good way to restrict lending ex ante mm. so, that you, uh, so that you lower the possibility that you will be faced with major bubbles bursting exposed. And to be honest with you, uh, I'm more in favor of leverage ratios, even though they are a terribly blunt instrument, mm -hmm. rather than uh, adopting maximalist views of what should be the bank's equity, uh, equity cushion. Mm -hmm. Why? Because sometimes you need to restrict lending ex ante rather than absorb losses exposed, mm -hmm. and you cannot do that through interest rates. Now, truth of the matter is, it didn't seem to work in Spain. Uh, Spain had adopted this very wise dynamic per provisioning uh, regime under which banks were charged ex ante, a higher capital charge for its loan that they were making. Why? Because Spanish interest rates were much lower than they should be because the ECB is arranging one interest rate for everybody, for all the 18 back then, 19 member states now. Mm -hmm. So leverage ratios uh, could also help you in situations where you cannot really use interest rates at all in order to, uh, in order to cool off the lending market. Having said that, it did not work in Spain. So the argument is theoretical. Uh, I have a paper on that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I have not published yet exactly because I have not found empirical evidence yet. Yeah, because another, another curiosity of banks, I was, because I'm a corporate lawyer, I'm tending, my sort of default mindset is to look at banks and finance as a kind of an industry, but a subset of all sort of firms that, that, that need govern. And a curiosity was... Uh, Early in your presentation, you mentioned that, I, th I think you mentioned this in the paper I read as well, on fractional reserve banking, that uh, where you've got, uh, where you've got low, no, the, the, the way we look at things in, in, in corporate governance, or maybe one I could say corporate finance, is where you've got high equity to debt ratio in an, in, in an industrial firm. So you've got a lot of uh, equity. You've got perhaps a lot of free cash flow. You don't know how to spend it. There's more propensity to impose agency costs on shareholders because you've got a lot of money that you can invest in unprofitable, non-value-adding projects. So then you get conglomerates and the like. Whereas as I understand what you were saying about banks is in banks where you've got high equity to debt, you've got the opposite scenario. It's where you've got 
Am I right? You well, you will never be... have. I mean, um, no. no, maybe I misunderstood it's, it's, it's that. Because, I think it's more because the, the the leverage ratio is so extreme. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have any corporate. That's one to thirty-three yeah. shareholders' yeah. money. Yeah. 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 The, the leverage ratio that uh, Basel has imposed is three percent. Yeah. That's one to thirty-three shareholders' yeah. money. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have lots of corporations that it's one to three. Yeah. Thirty percent equity over overall uh, company assets. Yeah. Now, if it's under that, probably the shareholders are taking the credits for a ride, yeah. and there is a yeah. major agency problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. here we talk yeah. really about dramatically low uh, leverage ratios. And there is, a, there is an argument by An, uh, D'Angelo and Stooge uh, who say, uh, and properly so, because the main job of banks is to create uh, safe liquidity claims, uh, the, fa uh, the so-called liquidity glow. The, uh, the job of banks is to, pre to uh, produce safe liquid debt assets and not products. And as a result, leverage is a good thing mm. because it allows them to produce more liquidity. Yeah. Um, it's in the same way that it's a good thing that a, a, a corporation produces more cars. Yeah. They use pro, uh, liquidity in their model like any other good. Mm. Um, and um, also they suggest that the Modigliani Miller is irrelevant to, uh, mm. to mm. banks. The, the, capital, the capital structure irrelevance model is mm. inapplicable to banks because the job of the banks is to provide liquid debt claims, yeah, yeah. safe debt claims that is. But the yeah. counter argument is that the banks blatantly failed to manage their asset side and they produced lots of unsafe mm. debt claims. Their loans to the uh, real estate uh, sector in Spain or Ireland or in the United States mm. were catastrophic. Not mm. everything was highly complex, opaque, innovative. Some of that was just blatantly and plainly stupid lending, mm. Mm. buying lots of Greek bonds. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. the answer to that is, in an ideal world, they would be... Uh, where everybody is rational and everybody has full information, there are no information asymmetries, they would be absolutely right. Mm. But in the real world, they are wrong because bankers are bound to make wrong decisions when it comes to capital allocation, when it comes to lending approvals, mm. to loan approvals. Yeah. And they will face, inevitably, when the cycle turns, they will face a shortfall of the value of assets over liabilities. There are going to be problems with the balance sheet. And if there is not enough shareholders equity there to absorb the losses, the bank is lost. Yeah. So just to put up sort of un underscore the discussion, uh, Eilish mentioned that academics are very good at noting problems, not so good at finding solutions. If we are looking for a solution, as I understand it, you would you would press down the structural reform route then? I would press for fiscal burden sharing because I think the structural reform road is a few de decades off. Right. It will come inevitably. Uh, why it will come inevitably? Because the more we are going to, uh, the more we regulate um, uh, the former sector, the more funding will go outside the regulatory perimeter to the shadow banking sector. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, innovation will take over. And I'm, as far as I'm concerned, apart from licensing uh, regulations uh, and obviously safety concerns, which go hand in hand with licensing regulations, that's why we license a, a, an operation in order to minimize, uh, to minimize risks. I'm not clear why Amazon cannot do exactly the same job as batteries. In terms of retail savings, mm -hmm. not in terms of corporate loans, not in terms of wholesale lending. And another main, uh, uh, another key thesis of my paper is that wholesale lending is an entirely different animal, and perhaps it should be looked as such. Any final questions, or comments before we draw this session to a close?